August 3rd meeting of the Scottville Planning Board. And in case anybody is interested, we are meeting this evening in the library of the high school instead of our usual home uh, due to the budget uh, that is being voted on tomorrow. So with that, then will you please, please call up uh, the vote. Uh, let's, I'm sorry, let's read, stand and pledge allegiance.
My name is Dan O'Reilly. I'm an engineer with Sebago Technics. Um, I'm going to represent the applicant uh, or the civil engineers, uh, surveyors, and landscape architects for the project. Um, as Dan mentioned, uh, we were last before you several weeks ago uh, with a preliminary plan uh, that's moved on to the town council. Uh, we have received the staff comments that uh, Dan summarized um, in the middle of last week. Uh, we've made revisions to the plans to address all those comments. Um, those will be ready to submit um, in a day or two. So I'm prepared to answer any questions you might have specifically about any of those. Um, the two, though, that I think I wanted to start out with addressing uh, are more the subject, really, of our, our last conversation with the planning board and then with some subsequent uh, meetings with the staff regarding access and, uh, in and out of the site and parking. Um, following our last meeting with the planning board, we met with the, the city's peer review traffic engineer uh, and the planning staff to talk about a number of different options. Uh, that might address the left, specifically the left turn movements um, from northbound Route 1 across two lanes of traffic and into the site. Um, obviously, that's a concern for both the residents and for the town. Um, after looking at a number of different alternatives um, and, and working through that in a fairly lengthy meeting with the, uh, with the staff and the, the peer review engineer, um, I think we all agreed that the appropriate approach for this uh, project, given its scale and scope and location, uh, would be to control uh, turning movements in and out of the site so that the site will be designed as a right turn in, right turn, turn out development. Um, that with the Delta Island would be constructed in the site entrance to prevent left hand turns from turning off of northbound Route 1 into the site. Um, after some discussion, uh, that island uh, has been shown on the plans. Um, it will be constructed uh, with a hard, drivable surface so that fire vehicles can roll over that median um, if necessary site with slope ramp curb. Um, in the latest comments, we've also added and included in that island um, a pedestrian refuge, essentially, so the side, as a pedestrian is moving north or south along the sidewalk, um, has an island in the center of that entrance so that they can stop if there's traffic moving one way or the other. Um, regarding the sidewalk, we have advised the plans to pull that sidewalk away from Route 1 to create an esplanade uh, in between Route 1 um, and, and the, the sidewalk. Uh, we've also in response to the staff's comments, uh, we'll include a, an easement for the town to maintain that sidewalk um, uh, as they do in other uh, applications or other sites. Um, regarding the parking, um, when we were last before you, we summarized uh, the parking demand that the best is experienced in their affordable housing projects in Cumberland County. Um, as we talked about in several meetings and presented to the, to the council in a couple of meetings, we are proposing the project as a 50-unit affordable housing development. Um, the, all of the units will be eligible for uh, residents that are no higher than 60% of the, um, the average median income for the area. And the majority of the units will be less than that, ranging from 40%, 50%, or 60%. Um, typically, um, research and studies that have been done across the country and have best experience is that residents of affordable housing projects generally own, less, own fewer vehicles and drive, make fewer trips than a market rate housing project of the same size. So the proposal is 50 units, including studios, one bedrooms, and two bedroom units. Um, we're proposing one parking space per unit with an additional five parking spaces on the site to be used for visitors. Um, as we talked about last time, Avesta Housing and all of its developments um, controls parking on their site with parking permits. It's written into the lease and it's enforced through their management. Um, so all the parking is controlled. So they have a good handle on the number of vehicles that are actually being used at their projects. Um, at our last meeting, or just prior to our last meeting, uh, we presented an analysis of, of several part, um, excuse me, affordable housing projects in Cumberland County that Invest has developed. That included three in Portland, two in Westbrook, and one in Bridgeton. Um, that information was reviewed by the staff, um, and they requested some, a follow-up to that with some additional information about those projects, their locations, and how they compare um, with the Southgate House project. Uh, we revised that memorandum. We did deliver it to the town late um, last week after we received the comments. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to read that or not, but I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to describe and walk through that. Essentially, the, the projects, um, after reviewing that and discussing it a bit with the staff, um, we decided that the three projects in Portland are you know, an urban project. They're, in, they're located in Bayside and on the peninsula. Um, they're close to walkable neighborhoods with public transit. So we've provided in that in, in the memorandum, revised analysis that eliminates those projects. 
The remaining projects in, in Westbrook and Bridgeton, we think, are um, similar to the Southgate House, um, but as Southgate is a little bit unique to Scarborough, it's also a little bit unique to Avesta um, in that Avesta has a number of projects that are in urban locations and some projects that are in more very rural locations, uh, but not much in the middle. So the projects that are included in that analysis uh, in Westbrook are two projects that are uh, located north of the downtown area, sort of on the north side of, of Westbrook. Uh, they are, one of the projects is between, depending on where you are on the site, um, is between 200 and 600 feet from a, a transit stop. And the other uh, project is more linear, and so it ranges from about 400 to about 1,200 feet from a transit stop. Um, that's a similar distance to where Southgate House is today. Uh, the existing transit stop at Dunstan Corner is about 1,200 feet south. Um, as part of the work we've done with the staff, the applicants agreed uh, to provide funding or to physically provide bus shelters for two new bus stops that um, the town is pursuing uh, with the transit provider. Uh, the town is working on the location of that with the provider and the, and the property owners in the area. And um, I think the, the last communication we had was that the, the likely location of that site it's just south of, south of the former Dunstan School, so about 600 feet from the site. So as part of the project, the applicant's going to be participating in a new transit stop that's in very close proximity to the project. What we found in the analysis, uh, to boil it down, is that looking at those pro the projects that we thought were the most similar to Southgate House, both in context in terms of their location, but probably more importantly, the population that they serve, is that um, the demand ranged from a, at about 0.7 parking spaces per unit was kind of the average of those sites. Meaning, for if you just took the number of units times 0.7, that's the actual parking demand. So applying that ratio to Southgate House would say that the parking you would expect would be about 35 vehicles. We're providing 55 parking spaces. Um, the some of the staff had some questions about some other investor projects in the area that were not included in the analysis. And when we approached this, we really looked at only projects that were income restricted. We didn't include projects that were age restricted or designed for uh, residents with disabilities. Um, those populations tend to drive even less than a straight affordable housing project. And we felt that including those would sort of artificially skew the number lower um, than what the actual demand of this project might be. Um, so the results of that are summarized in, in the memorandum. Um, there are no real or at least we haven't identified any real guidelines that are applied, particularly in Maine, for parking ratios at affordable housing projects. We did some research, though, for published studies that were done in other municipalities. We found a number um, across the country. Um, the ones that were most applicable or most easily to derive uh, parallels with this project were a project in, that was an extensive project that was undertaken by San Diego. And then, to, le to a lesser extent, some changes that Alexandria, Virginia made. Um, there were a number of other studies that were found, but most of those studies sort of approached the question more from the cost impact of parking on um, affordable housing, not so much the demand side of it. But what we found in those two studies were that the, the parking ratios that those studies identified were very much in line with what Avesta's experience is and, and what we're proposing. Uh, the, the San Diego model, if you will, uh, looked at uh, housing both from the standpoint of its uh, proximity to transit, uh, also based on uh, income level and, um, and, and those factors. And applying sort of the worst case um, ratios that they ultimately proposed and adopted, um, our pro those numbers still generate a lower parking demand than what we're proposing. If you apply that model to our site, it would say that the project should have 53 parking spaces where we have 55. Another study that was done in Alexandria um, looked specifically at affordable housing and parking demand based on income. And it gave a sliding scale based on the resident's income, how much parking would be required. And applying that model resulted in 0.7 spaces per unit for a project of this size and location, which, is, which correlates almost exactly to what Avesta's experience has been in the projects that were uh, included in that evaluation. So based on that, and as we've kind of talked about with the planning board and with the council, um, you know, Vesta through its experience is, is very comfortable and confident that the parking that's proposed on the site will meet the requirement based on their experience. Um, we did look, as we talked last time, at some other options to try to fit more parking on the project if, um, if that became necessary. Um, one option that we looked at was, was providing additional parking across the front of the building um, for 
you know, part of the objectives of this is to, is to preserve the, the historic appearance of that building when it's restored. And um, aesthetically, we didn't think that was the, a positive approach. Uh, it would net some additional parking spaces. It would certainly add parking across the front of the building, but you would lose a few spaces accessing them um, through where there's some existing spaces. The other approach that we can use if the, if the board is comfortable with it is that, you know, the ordinance does allow parking spaces to reduce, reduce in width. Right now, the uh, majority of the parking spaces are uh, nine feet in width, which is a standard space in the town. The spaces that we've shown that are in the shoreland zone portion uh, have been reduced to eight feet to reduce the impervious footprint. Um, if we reduce additional uh, spaces in the other three parking areas, uh, we can net out another three spaces if the board felt that was that was necessary. Um, and then the other option really would be to reduce some of the landscaping in the in that parking lot would also net out additional spaces. But uh, but again, those are options the board would certainly consider. Uh, but we're pretty confident that, you know, based on the best experience, that what we're closing would meet the uh, expected demand of the project. Um, I guess with that, I think those were the major topics that were our discussion. Uh, again, I'm prepared. We can answer any of the questions that came up through the staff review. But um, I'd kind of like to turn it over to you to find out what's important to answer those questions. Thank you. Uh, before I turn it over to the board, a couple of things. Um, I understand that the proposal right now is 55 spaces. Is that correct? Without the reduction from 9 feet to 8 feet, and what you just mentioned is uh, possible going into landscaping areas, is that correct? Yeah, what's presented on the plans at your last review was 55 spaces. The, the other comment, and uh, uh, board members should have received a copy of this, is that we do have a letter uh, from Rachel Gurley from Gurley and Kings Gallery right next door uh, that we will put into uh, the minutes. Uh, Question, uh, and I don't know if you've seen a copy of this. Yeah, that, that was presented to us at the last council meeting. I, I, I thought so, I just wanted to double check. Uh, having said that, I will uh, open it up uh, to the board. Mike, you want to start? Um, sure. Did, did, uh, can, you, can you tell me again uh, the confidence you have in ingress and egress of the site, especially heading uh, northbound Route 1? Uh, yeah, I saw it just just I, I saw the traffic analysis. It doesn't look like I mean many of the uh, time slots resulted in zero. <coughs> is that correct? Yeah, the the, the main the, the traffic study really looks at the the um, generation of the turning movements in and out of the site in the peak morning or afternoon hours, uh, and so the the movement that was of concern from the traffic standpoint was the eight left hand turns that we would project. Um, coming into the site in the afternoon rush hour, uh, crossing across the southbound traffic. Um, those are the those were the the uh, trips that uh, trigger the warrant for a left turn lane. You know, and as we talked about last time, any development on this corridor uh, that has as many as two left hand turns across that volume of traffic needs the warrant for a left hand turn. Lane. So those were the two. Those were the those were the the trips that triggered the potential for a left turn lane warrant. Uh, and I think the number of trips uh, out of the site in the morning that might turn left were, I believe, the trips in an hour. Um, now, on, do they have a design of this left turn lane already? Uh, a conceptual design? I mean, the one does not exist now, right? No, we prepared a draft that the staff could, you know, had asked us to look at. And, you know, a, 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 I shouldn't say a left turn lane, it would probably be a center turn lane. A shared center turn lane similar to what's in Route 1 um, in this section of Route 1 from uh, here up north. Uh, we did look at a concept of that to see if it was feasible, and you know, it is feasible. Uh, it would likely require uh, acquisition of right away, not in front of our site, but further to the north um, as you transition from that center turn, depending how far that center turn lane would be desired to go. Um, if it didn't go the full length of Route 1 to the next uh, signal, it would need to be transitioned back to a, a two lanes each way instead of a five lane section. Um, some distance to the north that would require the acquisition of right away on the east side of the project. Um, we looked at a couple different ways that that turn lane could be affected. You could widen to the to the north of the, the west side or you could widen to both sides. Um, widening to the east side of the road is somewhat problematic. There's a line of uh, three phase power poles that would be impacted and have to be relocated and then there's some additional wetland impacts as you get up towards the marsh in that direction. 
So we did we did prepare a, a draft um, during our conversation though with the staff at the peer review meeting here. It, was, it became clear that uh, that's a pretty significant um, policy decision that the town would have to undertake if that was of what the design for Route 1 ought to be through that section. Um, during the design of the Dunston Corner improvements, we've been told that um, there was originally a concept that the divider island that, that's in, some, on the, in the road today, extending up to the site, was originally envisioned to go much further to the north. Uh, that was scaled back, I think, for budgetary reasons. Um, so looking at improvements for that corridor, um, you know, it was the staff's opinion that that's sort of a, a town policy issue that's sort of beyond the scope of what a project that generates eight turns that are concerned would have would be expected to take on their own. But we have done um, a concept plan that shows how a, a center turn lane configuration could work on that corridor. So, uh, so, so you're not saying that this project is uh, has lost any real momentum because of this challenge, would you? No, I don't think so. Um, I think that um, you know. We're pretty confident based on the, the, again, the population and the traffic generation that we've done that controlling that left turn movement into the site, the way that we, we agreed what we worked through with the staff will, will address the needs of the project. Um, as far as the park, and I think I, I talked quite a bit about that last last week, and uh, I'm pleased to see that you've, uh, you're up to 55. I wouldn't be opposed to an eight foot uh, width more. Did you uh, consider any areas that you could show in a site plan that should, uh, several months after the project is completed, if, if it uh, proves that your analysis is a little bit uh, optimistic, that you could possibly add, add uh, parking? Yeah, I think the only real uh, feasible place to add parking would be additional parking along um, at the, in the drop-off area. We did show that. I believe we showed one space there. Uh, we looked at some other options, but we don't want to get any closer to Route 1 with the parking spaces than what we have today. So we're kind of restricted in that direction. Um, we're restricted coming to the, to the back side of the property because of the, the short end zone and the limitation of the purpose area. Uh, and the only other option, which we're not showing on the plan, would be to park across the front of the building. And I think when we looked at that, you know, that might net five or six spaces once it's all said and done. That would be a a large amount of pavement to put across the front of the building uh, right next to Route 1. But what, what I'm seeing on my plan right now is proposed parking to be built. Am I not? Yes. Yes, what was shown on the plan is proposed, and we have one additional space that could be reserved for a future space. Is that shown that way? Uh, so, yeah, there should, there should, there's a, a space shown here. Okay, I might be looking at the wrong uh, page. But right next to Handicap? Yeah. It's a little hard to see because of the concrete. Okay, that's it for now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. John? All right. Um, we'll deal with parking then. Obviously, we have to just kind of do a recognition of the council. If it's not something we can decide. Right, that's correct. That's the um, relaxation and the flexibility with the number of parking spaces is part of the contract zone application. It's one of the, the um, specific zoning allowances. Correct. So I'm good with that. And uh, the way turn only.
not where, where it is. Not many people would be crazy enough to try to do it in a way that is not allowed, but we all know people do that, especially around Dunstan. So that continues to concern me. I think it is the answer, right in, right out, absolutely. But in looking carefully at how that actually is designed. We, we talked at length with the, with the city staff about how that would be. Okay. And let them know a chance for review. And the fire department is all on board as well, right? And as far as I know, they have, we haven't gotten any additional okay. comments from that. Time. And um, if you give me a little bit, what, where are the snow uh, storage? Uh, the snow storage would be back here on the back of the site, here, and across the back here. Um, again, that, that's something the Vesta deals with on, on many of their projects. Most of their projects that are in urban areas um, have, don't okay. have really snow removal, so that's a, a kind of a basic part of their program. Okay. Um, <coughs> signage. There was something under um, architecture and signage. We're not having any signage, or we haven't seen it yet, or... We don't have a sign design. We have a location shown on the site plan right. the actual design. Sign design is not good for us yet. I don't have a, my, my biggest concern is the right turn in, right turn out. Um, we will have to walk. I, I will make sure that we watch it very carefully. Other than that, I think you've done a wonderful job of answering our basic early on questions. And I'm all happy. Thank you. Roger. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I agree with Sue. I think it's a great project, and I hope everything works out well for you. Um, my biggest concern has been the parking uh, and the, uh, the traffic flow. And um, I would trust that you folks understand the whole, con the whole concept of parking for this type of uh, residential, you know, occupancy that you have. Um, explain to me, I'm not quite sure about the right, right in and right how right now, what's going to happen right now, you know, should this thing go? I mean, how somebody's going off on Route 1, how are they going to get into the property? If they're heading north on Route 1? Yes, right now. Right now, they would have to, um, they would, well, they'd have to be coming south, and the most likely route to do that would be to take a left turn on Payne Road, head north, and then come down Millington Road. Okay, okay. And, and then, if they, and they'd have to do the same thing Basically, do the same yes, thing. if you want it to go north, come north. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I think that's. Oh, let me just ask you what's, what's the latest with the, the uh, porch? I'm kind of curious about that. <laughs> no, I, can't say, well, I, don't, I don't know what the latest with the porch is. We don't know yet. I'm Kyle Ambler, the development officer for Vesta for this project. Um, a couple months ago, we actually did receive our preliminary Part 1 historic National Park Service approval, so we kind of got through the first hurdle. Um, right now, we're, we're waiting for their full packet of what, what we can and can't do with historic structures. They identified the front porch as a significant 20th century structure or at least we think it's the porch, based on this description. Um, we'll get a little bit more definition in the coming weeks, but for now, that, that is the extent of the update. So basically, right now, they're, they're, they're suggesting keeping it? They, they think it's important, it okay. sounds like. Okay, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, I think that's all they have.
what's to stop me from jumping into the neighbor's yard and popping a U-turn, and, you know, whether it's another business or something, whether or not you see overflow traffic trying to do what you're trying to prevent. And I think it's natural for people to take that shortest, that shortcut rather than take the light go around. And it's just a messy area uh, traffic-wise. So that's my major concern. It's been my concern. I don't think it surprises you hearing it from me that that's my major concern with all of this. So. But for what we've got to do here, I think you guys have done a good job. Thank you. Okay, a little bit of more with your things, probably some of which we've already stated, but before we send a recommendation on to the council, I want to make sure we have all the dots in line for the thinking of, of, of the board. Uh, picking up on what Ben, I forget, I, I did drive down there. Is there a connection between where the antique facility is and where Southgate is so somebody could go directly into that parking lot or is it all blocked off? I can't remember. There's a fence now. There's, there's, a, a, fence. there's a split rail fence along the property. It doesn't extend quite the, all the way, all the, quite the full length to Route 1, but there's a there's a split rail fence along that, along the property line. Because as you were aware, you have an adversary and all you need the town would need to have people going through there and Okay, just right. yeah, yeah, there's no vehicle connection through between the two. <coughs> okay. Uh, the other thing, jumping ahead, is uh, uh, I know you got to go back to the council, but the, we as a board require any state or federal permits uh, to be in hand prior to making any final decision on the application. Right. Uh, a couple comments from from a new town engineer. Uh -huh. I think are relevant. And, and, one is the plans show a large block wall with guardrail and fence within the northeasterly corner of the parking lot. It does not appear to be much room between this wall and the property line in that corner of the parking lot. Uh, she's looking for some reassurance that this layout is, con uh, is constructible without the need for temporary construction easement from the neighbors. Is that correct? Yeah, that's true. Okay. Uh, you talked about the slow storage areas, so that. Uh, she also recommends that the, that the design should move the curb line on the traffic island at the main entrance back a minimum one foot uh, to prevent snow plows. Okay. And uh, she also uh, recommends that inspection, maintenance, and housekeeping plan should be edited to reference Thomas Cowell standards. Yep. There was one reference in there that had, a, had an incorrect date. Uh, we talked about the front porch, and that's up in the year right now. Um, talk about access, internal, you, you, you've dealt with the fire department, right? So they're okay with the fire call. Yeah, we'll get back with them again to, to make sure they're, they're okay with the new entrance configuration. But everything else that's on the plan was based on our conversation with them back in June. Um, you realize it has to be a stormwater management plan after the fact, too. Yes. Um, Susan, any problem with landscaping? <laughs> uh, no. I would like to ask a quick question before you're ready to move the motion. What was that, Susan? I'd like to ask a quick question about product procedure, if I may. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the letters that we receive from folks that are on particular issues, do we address them at this level? Do um, I'm not a good question. How does somebody who has concerns about a particular item know that we've actually gotten this other than the minutes saying that we received it? Do we, how do we respond to their, their concerns? <coughs> is this the place to do it is what I'm asking? Is there a specific response that the board wants staff to provide, the board wants to provide, you can do that um, at the meeting and they can get the minutes from the meeting or watch the tape or it can uh, look okay. otherwise sometimes the board Acknowledges and reviews the letter and puts it in the file. Um, I would like to do that if I might. With the, with the letter that came in from Rachel Curley, I believe it is, from the Early Antiques Gallery, yep. I would like to have the minutes of our meeting here go directly to her concerning this particular issue because I think many of her concerns were addressed this evening. But I would like to just take a second to say, to respond to um, the fact that her husband is a descendant of John Libby. <clears throat> well, we're related. So am I. I am one of those people that came right down from John Libby. <coughs> and I'm going to tell you the worst thing that could happen to anybody related to the Libby's is to 
see the property come down. And that's what happened to the Widow's Walk. Nobody wanted to save it, and it came down. Huge historic building. The thing about this property is that this is going to save this property. It has to meet certain standards <clears throat> in order to get the financing that the, the folks who are asking for this has to meet. It will be saved. It may not be completely 100% the way it was when it was originally designed, but this building will now become safe and saved. And I think it's a, I think it's a, a boon to the town to have that. <clears throat> We're not going to be um, destroying anything. We're going to be saving something. <clears throat> and then the, the question about how does it help the town, um, it's a very good question, and I think that we need to take a long, long, um, historic look at this. Skyrim has been trying for a very long time, a couple of decades, actually, to do something about uh, affordable housing in Scarborough. And, and that includes workforce housing, and it's been a struggle. And I personally am very proud to have been, to be part of not one but two efforts to take care of that, not to take care of, to, to address the issue. One would have to be um, Habitat for Humanity, which Scarborough was taking an active role in working with Habitat for Humanity to create that, and I think it's, we should be proud of this, and this is another one. This is the town working with an applicant to save a historic house. And um, I, I just think it's very, very exciting. So I, I hope that it says something to Rachel. I mean, I think that we're all on the same page. We don't want to see anything happen to this building, and I think that this is going to be sure that it won't, and maybe the minutes from the meeting will help as well. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, that's precisely why I mentioned before we even turned it over to the board that we had this in our, our possession uh, to give recognition to the weather. Appreciate your comments and, and addressing it. Uh, I think that's about all I have. Um, Sydney is this consensus. Agenda item number five, Verizon Wireless. 
request a site plan review for the transmission tower at 239 Broad Turn Road. This is map R24, Block 6. Would you like to sure. ease us into this? I'll ease you in. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This Verizon Wireless uh, Tower application is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Scott Anderson, and I'm here tonight with Chip for 
Gazette on behalf of Verizon Wireless. Um, what I'll do is kind of, because this is new for the town and for the board, um, talk briefly about some of uh, our goals and objectives and how we think they align with the ordinance. We've reviewed the comments that the town has received from some of the abutters and um, to the extent there are folks here or folks who will be watching, we'll try to kind of give a summary of our thoughts on how the ordinance works to address some of those concerns. Um, as I'm going, if I say anything that causes you to pause or you're confused, please feel free to stop me while we're going here and you as well um, to make sure as I'm going things make sense and are consistent kind of with your review of all the, the documents we, we've given you, which are so insignificant. Um, and primarily what we're hoping to do is get some of your initial thoughts on some of these more detailed uh, performance standards in your ordinance, uh, see what any additional information you might need um, so that we have some direction from the board as to how you're feeling about the project and what the next steps might be. Uh, big picture, we have uh, two primary goals with this site as we do with any site that Verizon Wireless develops. The first goal is that we are trying to improve cell phone coverage in town. Um, we provided um, the radio frequency report with our original application that identifies for the board and for everyone else areas where we think we have inadequate coverage and how the proposed project kind of ties in with some of the other adjacent uh, sites. And we talked a little bit about this at our last meeting. Basically what we're trying to do is put a uh, tower in a location at a particular height um, that will allow the coverage from this tower to kind of bump up against the coverage of the existing ones without coming up short or without running over and, and having too much overlap. So um, we ask the engineers to do the assessment that they, that they do based on what the coverage is from the existing, the existing sites and to identify a location and a tower height that fits this gap the best. Um, and um, I, we appreciate, we saw some of the comments, uh, when we identify a coverage gap, it does not mean that a phone will never work, uh, that that's some sort of dead zone. What it means is for the type of use that people are making of their cell phones, which is both voice and data, and at varying levels of intensity of use. So when everybody's got, you know, when the Patriots are, you know, coming down to the last two minutes and everyone's grabbing their phone out and texting everyone, there's, uh, that affects the signal. And so at some point in time, you may get a, a, a signal for voice, at other times you won't, uh, or data can be more challenging than voice. So the way we design the network is the engineers take a look at what is working now and what's not working, and then we build the network to, to meet that. Uh, well, gone are the days of that gentleman in the ads where he walks every five feet and says, can you hear me now, and can you hear me now? Um, so uh, based on what we've done, we've uh, identified a need here. Um, so that first goal of, uh, of improving coverage is the purpose of the site. Um, your consulting engineers at Woodard and Carmen, as Dan mentioned, um, include some RF folks on their staff. And they took a look at our proposed project and the coverage gap. And uh, our interpretation of their report was they agreed with us that there is inadequate coverage in this area. And that, at least as an engineering issue, that our project fits that coverage gap. Um, we talked a little bit at the last meeting about how Verizon Wireless is trying to improve cell phone service in town in a number of different ways. This is one of the projects. Um, we recently are working on a project in a church steeple where no one will see it. It's a stealth site. Um, we're having discussions with the town about potentially putting small antennas on uh, light poles in front of Hanford and Cabela's to provide some coverage in those areas. Um, there's another tower application that is before you now. We've been communicating with those folks about possible co-location on that tower. So the solution for the town of Scarborough, from our perspective, will be a mixture of things in steeples and little things on light poles that no one will see, and then there will be some uh, new towers as well to uh, provide the kind of coverage that we're looking for the entire town. So this is one part of a kind of a bigger project to improve cell phone, tower, uh, cell phone coverage in town. So if goal number one is to improve coverage, goal number two is to do it with the smallest impact on the fewest number of people as possible. Um, uh, cell phone antennas need to be seen for them to work. They can't be completely hidden. When we do a church site, we remove the wooden panels of the church steeple and we replace them with a material that looks like wood and it's white and 
matches up, but it's actually the material that allows the, the signal to go through. So trees and buildings and other uh, topographical obstructions must um, affect how the cell phone system works, and essentially the rule is you need to see it in order for it to work. But what we try to do is um, place the site, uh, place the tower in a particular site at a height um, that minimizes these impacts to the greatest greatest extent we can. And so when I look at those two goals for us, I think those are the two goals that the town's new wireless ordinance has been drafted to, to um, provide for. So there was a determination that um, uh, additional cell phone coverage was a good thing for the town, but there are a series of standards that we need to meet working with the planning board um, that addresses the second goal, which is to minimize the impacts as, as much as possible. And, um, there's two big categories of, of standards that the town has enacted that we need to meet in order to build a new tower. Um, Dan had mentioned the priority of location discussion that we had at the last planning board meeting uh, for folks that, that are paying attention and maybe haven't read through the entire ordinance. There's kind of two hoops we have to jump through before we can propose a new tower. The first is we have to show that there are no existing structures anywhere where we can add um, our antennas. Um, we looked in the area, concluded that there were no um, existing structures that we could locate on, and Woodard and Kern agreed with us that that was the case. So that was the first hurdle. Uh, the second hurdle is we have to show that we can't meet this coverage uh, gap by going with a tower in, in one of the lots that are zoned industrial. So we went through that process and did that evaluation, concluded that we couldn't do it with the tower in the industrial zone, and again, we didn't occur and agreed with us that, that that was the case. So we had an initial, kind of over that first hurdle, which was, is it um, feasible to build a new tower? And so we got through that discussion with the planning board at the last meeting, and now where we go is a second big chunk of standards in the ordinance that deals specifically with what's going on right where we propose to put the tower. And there are a number of standards that regulate how high it is, uh, how big the lot has to be that it's on, how far is it from different property boundaries, um, buffering around the site and what it looks like, uh, whether or not there's lighting or advertising. So a number of other kind of small and more detailed requirements um, that are there, again, to minimize the impact of others, to allow companies to provide better coverage, but doing it at, at a way that kind of minimizes the impacts of folks in the, in, the, in the neighborhood. So one of the new bits of information that we provided to the board, and I'm sorry, we were hoping to do a fancy PowerPoint, uh, but with a change of venue, um, I brought some hard, hard copies that we can hand out. We had provided to the planning board photo simulations of, uh, with two different variables. One, we, uh, and the way this works, and some of you may have seen the balloons, we, we flew a balloon. The town asked us to not only fly the balloon at 120 feet, which is our proposed height, that's the yellow balloon uh, for any of you that have seen it, but also to fly a red balloon at 150 feet, which would be the maximum height that the board could uh, allow a tower in order to encourage co location on the tower. So we flew the balloon at both, at both heights so that folks could get a sense of how high a 150 tower would be. And you can see in the simulations you know, the difference between the two. The other variable, we asked Ben Karen, who's our photo simulation guy, to uh, do a run of simulations showing it as a monopole tower, which is the flat gray um, towers that you're used to seeing but also do it uh, as what we call a monopine, which is a tower that is made to look like a tree. Um, in particular, at a height of between 90 and 120 feet, the monopine can often be a very effective way to provide essentially on the tower buffering of the project. Um, if you're doing a 190 foot tower, given the relative tree canopy, those usually look horrible because they stick way up above and it's just bigger and darker. Um, but one of the things that I think you can see in the photo simulations is um, that at this level, given the surrounding vegetation, um, it, it actually helps blend the tower in uh, to the existing vegetation in a way that, that dramatically minimizes the uh, visual impact. So um, but I'm, I'm just going to put a couple up here for folks that are interested and want to just grab, want to take a look at. 
this is the pine tree list stack, and that's the, the model pole. This is we're talking about it. Feel free to go ahead and look through those. So, so that's our, our, our proposal um, is the 120 foot um, tower. We provided the simulations to give the board um, a sense of what these would look like, either as a, a tower or as a tree. Um, picking up on Dan's comments, I guess just addressing some of the comments, we're continuing to work with the, the fire chief. Um, we're, we're trying to do is make sure there's a width of the road that. Um, the fire department is comfortable with for access without having to cut more and do more cut and fill um, with the topography in order to provide that access. So we're continuing to, to talk to the, the, the fire chief about those issues and we'll continue the discussion. Um, the, there have been, um, what I probably should do is just talk a little bit about tower height and co-location. And then, as opposed to walking through the simulations, I'm sure you've all had a chance to look at it. Maybe it would be better just to go to questions that the folks have about them. Um, what we've done about tower height is to try to propose the height that is the lowest that's necessary for us to fill this coverage gap. And um, there's actually some language in the ordinance that allows the planning board, 130 is the deemed the kind of average height, but the planning board can drop us down to 120 or 110 or even lower um, if board were to con conclude that a lower tower would work. So we've provided the coverage at 120 feet tower height, and we've also provided some plots if the tower would drop to 110 or 100 or 90 feet. Uh, we've concluded that it doesn't work for our project to fill the coverage gap, and Woodard and Curran looked at that as well, and I think agreed with us, at least to the extent that they were looking at co-location issues. So we think we've done what we're required to do, which, was, which is the lowest tower that works for us so that nothing gets built that isn't necessary. And you can see, you know, you get a sense between 120 and 150 what the uh, visual impacts will be and how it will change um, if we would go as high as 150 and that's information for you to consider. Um, what you're trying to do is balance between having us build the smallest tower possible while still providing for co-location. Um, our th thought is that usually the best thing to do is, in the absence of another pending application, um, we think it makes sense for us to build the 120, but to make sure that the foundation is designed so we can hold the tower as high as 150 with you know, two or three other carriers located on the tower. Um, the process that the carriers use is when CHIP or CHIP's counterpart at AT&T gets a report from the engineer saying, find me some place to hang my antennas in this area, he first goes and looks for existing towers, because that is the quickest and cheapest way to get your antennas up in the air. So in the event AT&T comes into this area, they will do the same thing. They'll identify Chip's tower, give them a call, say, you know, what's the loading that you have on there? Um, is there space? They'll run their plots at different elevations to see if they can make use of the site. And this board would require that applicant, as part of the priority of locations, to, on that first step, to show why there couldn't be a tweak to this tower that would allow them to use our tower as opposed to the new tower. Um, and the site is available. Uh, the foundation will be designed for a higher tower, and it can be modified to be taller. Um, it may be that a lower level would work for a different carrier depending on where their other sites are, so it might not need to go up, but it is certainly expandable vertically to get to 150 feet if the board decided with a subsequent outcome that would be helpful. Um, but our, our thought is it makes sense for the visual impact purpose and that is if you get one point for now. But interested in your thoughts on that. Um, I think, just so you don't have to listen to me talking the whole time, I'd probably turn it over to the board for any questions that you have like us to walk through any of the simulations or talk about them in, in specific detail, um, we are ready to do so. Thank you. Uh, before I turn it over to the board, two things um, Dan mentioned, but I want to be more specifically uh, specific. We have uh, three letters uh, from individuals within the area. One uh, is from a Nicole Lane, um, they live in Cottabook, which is the address on this one. Uh, another is from a Mark Eric Emo at 11 Cottabook Drive. And the third is from Antoine Holder, who lives at 8 Cottabook. Right. Six. So for the record, uh, 
discussion. And as in the past, uh, I ask that if you are going to speak, first of all, you give us a, your name and address, and you keep your comments down to approximately five minutes. And any subsequent speakers, I would hope, would not repeat what they just heard. Uh, certainly, I want everybody to have an opportunity to express themselves, but uh, and for the sake of time, uh, you not hear the same thing over and over again. One other comment I want to make before we get into a public discussion. This board does not have the jurisdiction to give an opinion on any health aspects of a uh, tower. Uh, so we cannot address that issue. The second issue I want to address before uh, turning it over to the public is that uh, one of the accusations is that there hasn't been uh, enough notification. First of all, before the standards even came to the board, it was widely discussed uh, as to what those standards would be. There were plenty of opportunities for public input in creating the standards that we have to go by. So it, this was not done behind closed doors in any sort of secret way. Um, I think there has been more than enough uh, public notice of what the potential is as far as building uh, cell towers in, in the town of Scotland. Uh, having said that, I will now open it up to the public for anybody who cares to address the board. Anybody? I'd like, to, I'd like to say something. I live. Uh, can you get, come up to the microphone, please? Uh, my name is Anton Boder, and I wrote a letter. Um, I live at 6 Carter Brook Drive. Um, first of all, I absolutely appreciate the need for cell phone towers. I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. Um, I would encourage you very strongly to keep it at 120 feet. I saw the balloons, the, the, the lower of the, the balloons, as far as I was concerned, was, was acceptable. But, but please, please, please try to disguise it as a pine tree. Because it's a beautiful, beautiful line of trees. And if we have a tower sticking out, visually, it's, it's, it's really ugly. So, I mean, I'm not opposed to cell towers. It would be wonderful if it wasn't in my backyard. But, but I mean, I mean, I understand. I understand where we are. Um, I might have even. Did you drive down our street with a Prius by some chance? No. Anyway. But it, but, but in any but in any event, make it look like make try to make it look like a pine tree. Try to keep it at 120 feet. And then once it's at 120 feet, try to keep it at 120 feet. Don't come back two years from now or 18 months from now and say, sorry guys, we're at 150 feet. Okay? Because really, I mean, from this picture it doesn't look bad, but I mean, I can imagine the worst. And it would be just nice if we can preserve the tree line, preserve the rural character, and um, that's, that's my opinion. Thank you uh, for both the, your letter to us and your comments. And I'm going to jump ahead and probably out of order, but I'm going to say as long as I say we're supportive, we won't go any further than 120 feet. I can assure you of that. Thank you. I, 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 really, I really appreciate that. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Sure. Good evening, I'm Mark Eric Amaro, one of the contributors of the letters that are set forth in front of you, address of 11 Hardbrook Drive in Scarborough, and I do oppose the construction of the cell phone tower uh, that has been proposed before you. We are new residents of Carterbrook Drive, we did our homework and looked at different neighborhoods around. Carterbrook Drive did not have any proposals for a cell phone tower. And what sold us on the place was the looks, the character, the aesthetics of the neighborhood, and the possibility of future growth. Since we've built our house, we've had one other one next to us constructed and another one underway. These are good things for more growth in the town of Scarborough. 
cell phone tower definitely will hinder anybody's desire to be moving within the neighborhood and building. One of my reasons of why I oppose the construction and approval of the cell phone tower. Uh, in addition, it's going to contribute to the damage of our property value and our neighboring surrounding property values as well. I also mentioned the damage of the character and aesthetics of the neighborhood. Open area, nice tree line, beautiful skies. A 120-foot tower will stick out like a sore thumb. 150-foot, even worse. Personally, I do have Verizon as a coverage. I do not have any problems with the coverage in the area. Verizon has great coverage in the area. And last but not least, I feel that other locations nearby do exist and should be considered. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank Again, you. Tanda, for your letter <coughs> appearing before us tonight. The, the, the only other comment I would like to make, and this is not call calling, don't let anybody read into it, is that the only function of this board is to follow the standards. Now, this is brand new, so we're, we're learning as we go along. Be honest with you, but we, if we're handed a, a standards, and it is our function to make sure that the applicant is following those standards uh, or not, and uh, that may be up for discussion. But I, it's not our prerogative to change them per se. Uh, I'm, I'm the first to say that uh, there are some gray areas, uh, and I keep going over the. So uh, I can understand that uh, uh, there is a need for open discussion uh, about these new projects. And I've said, having anybody else, I'm sorry. Okay. Let me close the public discussion and open it up to the board. Uh, Nick, you want to start, please? I'm going to ask you to defer while they call it.
but if you were if, if it were to be go higher than 120, do you add that from the bottom, or do you add it to the to the top to go higher? Uh, to be honest, I've never actually uh, worked on a project where we built a monopod that was extendable. Okay. Okay. The, the case uh, is true for a monopole. Just the galvanized steel pole can certainly be designed to be extendable, and chances are. Uh, if you were to recommend a 150-foot monopole, we would build our 120, the foundation design for 120. Uh, we'd actually have a 150-foot order, a 150-foot monopole, and leave the top 30-foot section off. Oh, okay. Okay, so the addition would go on top. That's right. Okay. I don't know if you missed this program. I just heard. Did you say the foundation would be 120? Along the foundation and the pole. We would design and, we would design and purchase a 150-foot monopole foundation we designed for that 150 foot monopole, we would not put on the, the uh, third right. extension. I yeah. I think it's right. Just, yeah. Just a quick okay, no, no problem. Just a couple of other questions. Uh, um, on, on, um, say it, it, it's only at 120 and it's down from the future, some other carrier would want to. And they, they, they do their studies and, and this is a location they want to have there. Mm -hmm. They're poles, okay. They're poles. Um, can there can there be another tower? Can there be another tower? Put right near like adjacent to it. Yeah, I, I saw one this week down in. Uh, I mean, New York. ultimately, I mean, as an engineering uh, consideration, there needs to be some distance. But I think that would largely be a planning board determination. I mean, what would happen is, you know, AT and T comes in and they think that this works. And you would say to them, okay, what height do you need? And if they needed to go higher, you would say, do a couple things. Show us the photo simulations of the height, you know, and extending the tower and what that would look like. But you would also say, all right, what are your other alternatives? It might be that AT&T going a half a mile away with a 90-foot tower um, in a place that was kind of, wasn't visible from any location or the board would decide that that would be preferable to extending the height of this tower, that would be a consideration and you would want to explore it. I, I think the way your ordinance is written, it's a question of the board getting as much information as possible about all the different options that a carrier would have so that you can look at what the town would prefer. And it, it might be that extending it by 10 feet, you would decide that was the best route. You might also decide that building a, a new tower someplace would be better because you couldn't see both of them and it would prevent this tower from being made higher. I suppose you could agree to, to put two next to each other, but I haven't seen a double tower site since the first generation of cell phone towers on rural mounds in the middle of nowhere. Actually, if you go down the main turnpike, right down around York, or that's yeah, right. Two. Yeah, those, were, those, were, those were done in the late 90s. It's okay. been a long time since okay. it's actually happened. Tower farms. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I think boards are now realizing, municipalities are realizing that they prefer one structure in front of to suit four or five carriers as opposed to a tower farm where you've got maybe two or three within a half mile radius. In fact, in fact, yeah, in fact, there's a lot of, I've read many ordinances where there's actually tower separation clauses where no uh, two towers can be closer than a mile or two miles from one another. Okay, so right. uh, the last last question sure. and it pertains to one of the um, residents' uh, questions about the location. Mm -hmm. um, on, on your look, on your map here, uh, was there any consideration to placing it any place else, or is it just not feasible to do that on this site? Well, there's there's kind of two primary considerations. One is the tower height is tied to topography. Yeah. So um, if you go up and down a hill, the tower needs to be bigger if you go down the hill. So one of the things that we're looking at is the height of the tower and trying to keep it below 130. Um, the other uh, uh, siting consideration is uh, to, you know, the, the, you're working with a landlord who wants you to locate in a way that um, works for what they're using the land for. Um, but also, when we do it, we talk to the landlord about, look, we don't want to put it in the middle of the field, right? There's a field right next door. That might work for us from an RF standpoint, 
but um, we're trying to put it on the site in a way that works for the coverage, works for the landlord, for the use of the property, but also puts it in a way, as Chip is looking at the site, that he knows there will be some buffering and that it will kind of fit as best we can into the surroundings and minimize the visual impact from multiple different angles. So you have a bunch of factors that go in and then that was the, what led to the election of this particular point on the So, so basically, hmm. you're, uh, you don't feel you could move that around based on what, what the land body wants, plus uh, the landowner and me are the top, top, top topography of the, of the site. Well, you're you, pretty much... You might be able to. I mean, it might be if the topography doesn't change. I think when you look at um, 50, 60, 70 foot shifts of a tower, um, it has a very limited impact on the visual impact from where we are going. I mean, even if you were to move it 50 feet closer to the Carter Brook Drive subdivision, provided that you have some vegetation at the base of the tower, and given that it looks like a pine tree, it's not going to look that much different. So, um, you know, certainly moving it a thousand feet will change where it goes, but that likely starts to move it outside of that search ring that we had talked about the last time, which is where it needs to go. So there's a number of factors, and we've tried to pick one that's kind of a balance. You know, I came up at the last planning board meeting about the setback, and I apologize that the one thing that uh, board members had asked for is the specific setback to this closest property line, which we missed. It's 255 feet. We'll have the engineers add that specific setback to the plan. Uh, but there's a provision that allows you to move this from 100% to 300%. Uh, moving it to 100% moves it a little farther away from Carterbrook Drive, but closer to the others, and it may require the height of the tower to change. Moving it 300%. On one level, would seem like a good thing to one set of boundary lines, but then it moves it closer to another. So we've tried to kind of cite it in a way that it meets all the standards, but do it you know, with some vegetation and ways to try to minimize the impacts all around. I'm all set. Uh, before I go on, I want to get something clear. Keeping it at 120 feet, would that be enough height have another entity at 120 feet. It's, I hear you say somebody might want to go to 130 and 150 if you took on another, another, carrier. another carrier. Yeah, I, what we know is that you couldn't put someone else at 120. The antennas can't overlap on that elevation or there's too much signal interference. Normally there's a 9 or 10 foot separation. So, I mean, the first thing that the planning board would ask AT&T or T-Mobile would be, why can't you go at 117, which would be 10 feet below our, our uh, or 107, sorry, 107, which is 10 feet below our antenna center line, and show us why that doesn't fit your coverage objectives. Um, if it does, then that would be the resolution by the board. The tower would remain the same height. They would add their antennas 10 feet below ours. They're going to be hidden by the branches, and they drop their shelter inside the fenced area. Um, it would only be if if another carrier couldn't meet the coverage objectives at 107, that the board would then entertain, I would think, um, moving the tower up. And that would be subject to the same kind of review by Woodard and Carr and feedback from them as to whether they would really believe it. I know we're jumping into the future and talking yes. about that. I and mean, I know it doesn't pertain to you <laughs> exclusively, but hearing what we had just discussed, if I'm still, still sitting on the board and not in an old age home, um, I would not hope, even for co-location, going above the 120 feet. So uh, any future uh, cohabitants would have to convince me that they could do what they wanted to do, stay at 120 feet. Yeah, and, and that's, I think that's why the town set up the ordinance this way. That, you know, you have, you have flexibility at all these different stages in the process. You can require someone to go on an existing structure, you can take a look at co-location, but, but based on the actual impacts of changing a site to allow co-location, you might actually elect another option to provide coverage. And I think the board has all those different options. Well, the thing that we don't know is what the other carriers could considerably need and when they might need it. Um, there's a lot of cooperation when a tower is up and the carriers talk to each other and they do their engineering and try to figure out what can be used. But we don't have a lot of information about 
what AT&T's plans are, what their next sites look like. Could it be six months? Could it be ten years before someone else came to you? Um, which is why our suggestion is we do it at 120, which is what we need. We do the best we can to camouflage it, and at that height, the camouflaging works very well. And then you kind of leave for a, a later day the option of requiring any number of different changes or new projects in order to meet a subsequent applicant's uh, proposal. Susan? Thank you. 
be able to see that. Well, if you just left it a regular chain of events, I mean, it's just a minor thing, but I just... I, we'd, be, we'd be happy to do it either way. I don't know. Is there any reason for that, Dan? That, that's a that's a requirement under the site plan ordinance for all. It applies to all commercial development. So typically, you know, fencing is in more visible locations, <laughs> right? Um, such as our business areas. So that's that's really just taken out of that context. Yeah. So if there's under the site plan ordinance, the board has the ability to, to grant waivers. So if that's a big issue for the applicant and the board's comfortable with. I think it's more not having to do that, then we can entertain that. I think it's more of an issue for a wandering animal. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do it either way. I mean, whatever. The, the other question I had, uh, Ron, is uh, in the future, I'm just kind of curious about procedural. Uh, in the future, when there's a, a, another uh, carrier wants to co locate, do they have to come back to us or do they just deal with whoever owns the tower? There's an existing tower? Yeah. Like, for instance, like, like in this case here, is, um, does Verizon have to come to us again to co-locate on here? And they would come to you and present that they're locating on an existing tower, and they go through only the first step of the prior location. So it would be an amendment of the site plan. It would be an amendment to this threat. It would add a different antenna to the tower. So okay. 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 you probably have to do some sort of site straight up also. We would likely have it come back to the board because you would be looking at a lot of the same information, the RF analysis, you know, where they need coverage, and if this tower meets their needs, then it so has basically what I would agree. I would okay. agree. That's what I'm saying. You don't need yes. this process of four meetings, three meetings, stuff. Okay. No, the tower would be there. So there would be an okay. analysis of looking at just the amount of the okay. location. What else do you need to give us? Because I'm going to make a recommendation that at the next meeting there'd be a consent plan put together by staff in conjunction with you working out final details. We're happy to do that. Okay, I do have one thing, and I was remiss in the last two. One of the, both, in both of them, is a 12 foot wide roadway where the fire department really wants 20 feet. Now, how do we get around that? We changed it to 20 feet. You did change it? Yeah, we okay, changed great. it. That's great. I, and, and I, I, I didn't probably make that clear enough, but yeah. yeah. The staff, I, I, of course, said we changed it. Yeah. Okay, and, and my last comment is. During the construction phase, how is the club going to function? How is the what going to function? Club going to uh, oh, function. I don't think that should be a real problem. I mean, Lewis can talk to that more than I can, but it's really, I mean, it's like a 30-day construction period, and maybe 45 at most, and they'll be able to bring in the materials and do a staging area back there. I don't think there's going to be real uh, interruption, but I don't get my hands dirty. That's the thing, so I'm sort of guessing this is a little bit. Where the site is located is nowhere near where the members are shooting. So it won't have any dysfunction. I don't know that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Or you can provide this. I'm a golfer, and all I can think of is when I go into range and they have that person picking up the ball from <laughs> the range and so forth. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we can then, you know, Finish this up with the idea that the, at the next meeting we you can work with staff and get a consent. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Next agenda item number seven. Tina and Eric Richardson request a preliminary subdivision review for a four lot residential subdivision titled Fortune Estates. Assessors map R10.9. And, I, 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 yes, uh, John has to, uh, uh, Mr. Dupont has to pick, uh, lose himself because of an affiliation. So, uh, close, close, extremely friendly. Yeah. <laughs>
Chairman, do you want to? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the board's seen this plan one. in the past as a sketch plan. We've also conducted a site visit to, to look at the, the property where the four lot subdivision and, and roadway is proposed. Um, it, I think on, on this one, in terms of staff comments, most of the comments can revolve around um, the design of the roadway and its, and its interconnection or intersection with uh, Mitchell Hill Road, uh, where this is a very steep section of Mitchell Hill Road. Um, the site is also uh, a steeper site than uh, many subdivisions we've seen in the past. So, um, for that reason, the Public Works and the Town Engineer look pretty closely at the design, um, and they're reluctant to want it to be a public road. And the applicants agreed to proposing it as a private road. Uh, in large part, that feeling is based on the Mitchell Hill Road and, and how it interacts with this proposed roadway. Um, there's a lot of concern about winter operations. Um, access to the road and etc um, for public works equipment and also to some degree um, you know, school buses and other public uh, services for the roadway. Um, so uh, the staff at least is glad to hear that the applicants open to a private uh, road proposal versus public for, for many of those reasons. Um, other than that there's also some continued kind of concern with how the private, private road intersects with Mitchell Hill Road and uh, the town engineer and the consulting engineer and traffic engineer. I'd like a bit more information in terms of um, grading analysis for that intersection, um, having more detailed um, spot grades and, and a better understanding of how that's going to tie in. Again, for many of the same reasons, but also for ingress and egress just for the residents of, of the um, proposed neighborhood as well as those traveling along Mitchell Hill Road in this section. Um, this sort of along the same lines, just having a bit more information on, on how drainage it would be handled um, and more information on uh, those contours for the road construction and, and home construction on the various sites. Again, just given the um, topography of the area and fitting a, a sub, four lot subdivision road into the, into the hill side there. Um, I think other than that, I mean, that that's really the, the thrust of uh, the concerns with this one. Um, there's also uh, interest to, you know, in there's a fair amount of open space uh, planned for the project and the town, this is also in close proximity to the Nonsuch River, which is the town's priority um, stream and river corridor where we've worked hard for a number of years to, to see conservation land um, connected and preserved. So if the applicants are open to it, the town's likely to be interested in um, you know, having the open space be conservation that maybe we can provide some public access or just be part of the corridor along the Nonsuch River. Um, and um, I think those are kind of the highlights. Um, as I mentioned, the town engineers look closely at it. Um, it has a staff memo that the applicant has, again, around um, grading and, and road design and stormwater. Um, and Wood and Kern has similar you know, questions and comments of the applicant on those topics, as well as uh, Coral Palmer, our uh, peer reviewed uh, track. So. Thank you. Uh, Uh, good evening, uh, members of the board. My name is Jason Matthias, and I'm representing uh, Eric and Tina Richardson uh, for this project. Um, I think the last time that we met, we were at that site walk, and there's been uh, a pretty good uh, wading through the, the first round of uh, engineering comments from the town. Um, and uh, I'll try to keep this brief as I know we got uh, one right behind me. Um, it is an open space, four lot subdivision. Uh, you don't see all the open space here, but it is along the Nonsuch corridor, as uh, Mr. David mentioned. And uh, we certainly would be willing to, to work with the town over taking over ownership of that. Um, another 
thing that we have settled is the actual name for the subdivision with the public safety uh, records. And uh, it is now called Fortune Estates with a road name, uh, Serendipity Lane. Uh, as far as uh, traffic comments do, we have supplied a traffic analysis by Traffic Solutions. And uh, I don't think there's anything in the, the review comments that have come back in that uh, I don't think we can work out from the staff. Um, just looking for a little more detail and maybe a little more construction grade plans at this point. Um, and I'd like to open up for more questions if any of the members have them on any of the particular issues. Okay, but before we turn it over to the board, this is also open for public discussion. So if there's anybody from the public that would like to discuss this particular issue, come up, give your name, uh, address, and please keep your comments to within five minutes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Herb Bray, and I'm at uh, 80 Mitchell Hill Road. Um, <coughs> my property and, and house abuts this, uh, this uh, proposed right of way. Um, I saw Jason. I had other questions um, uh, before we got here, and some of them were answered by. Uh, the proposed landscaping uh, drawing that, that Jason gave you earlier uh, when I first got here. I'll try to keep this brief too. Um, you know, my my concerns and my wife's concerns are obviously you know how this affects us, our property line, and uh, and uh, obviously the looks of, of how this is going to affect us. Uh, now, it, uh, it doesn't show in this drawing. I don't believe, but uh, it shows, you know, I guess this question would be directed towards Jason, you know, it, it talks about uh, 35 different trees uh, placed along the, uh, the right of way as uh, the screening. And like I said, that, that's one of the biggest issues that I have, is the, uh, the screening and how the headlights are going to be shining in and out of the house you know, at night. Um, <coughs> Uh, I know, Jason, the, the drawing says, you know, 35 trees along that uh, right of way. Um, if 35 trees don't get you all the way to the end, um, but basically, how tall, it doesn't say in this drawing how tall the trees and how wide they are. Um, if the trees, 35 trees, don't make it all the way to the end, will you still finish it and go all the way to the end, even if it takes 40 trees? Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I just want to hit uh, real quick um, is uh, <clears throat> when will these trees and, and all of the, the buffering that, that we're going to, and screen that we're going to uh, try to work with, uh, will they be planted at the beginning of the project or at the end of the project? And if you start, the, the first lot, lot one is, is going to be the first one to be built. Um, and I, th I think I'm, I'm right on that. But if, if the first one is lot one, um, and you guys start this, and then three years, four years down the road, you get to the last one, you know, do I have to wait four years before I get screened, or is that going to be done, you know, during this construction of the road? Um, I, I'd like to know that. that. Um, <clears throat> on one of the 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 letters that was uh, addressed to, to uh, Mr. Chase, uh, <clears throat> it talked about uh, a fence, and the fence, um, I guess the, the director had uh, mentioned putting the fence on private property. Does, does that mean that the fence would have to go on my property? If you could kind of help us understand that that part of it, um, uh, I've been enough. I've been a part of enough projects over my career to uh, <clears throat> see things like this uh, get put into the plans, and then as the project uh, goes on and the budget starts to uh, <clears throat> get tighter for whatever reason. Um, I've seen things like this kind of drop off, you know, 
and, and not get done or get abbreviated. Um, I'd like to see um, this a part of the approval project. project. And I know I've, I've seen in, in other board meetings that, uh, and I haven't been to a lot, and it's been a very, very good and learning process, but I know the visual part, you know, the, the trees, the flowers, even the height, the width of signs uh, get put into the, the approval process uh, so it doesn't, doesn't uh, get forgotten or, you know, if it is, to me, if it isn't written down and documented, it never happened and it never will. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that this will be a part of the, the approval process. Um, <clears throat> The road configuration, I don't know if that has changed at all, but the, the lot one house, I know the driveway, there was an issue with the driveway. And if that has changed in, in the location of the house, um, what's the distance from the edge of the first house lot one to the property line? Has that changed or is that still the same? I think the driveway configuration is a little bit different. I apologize. We, we just got back from vacation. I traveled all day today just to be here for this. Oh, you're doing um, fine. You're doing fine, seriously. Um, okay. Um, so we've had uh, very little time to be doing this. But uh, uh, <clears throat> if that's changed at all, I'd, I'd like to know. Um, and I know, uh, Jason, you spoke a little bit about the, uh, uh, the private property versus public, uh, a private road versus a public road. Um, on the, the letter to, Jay, uh, to uh, Mr. Chase, I think it was uh, item number four and 23, it, uh, 23 being the response, I think it was, and it kind of contradicted each other um, in reference to the private road versus non-private road. And I was just curious, who's going to maintain that road if things start to fall apart, you know, erosion and, and that kind of stuff. Is that going to be the responsibility of, of the association? Is there going to be an association? Or is it going to be part of the town's responsibility to fix that? Like I said, I, my biggest concern here is how it's going to affect me and, and, and our family. And, you know, the integrity of that road, where it's going, and The infrastructure in that road is, is, is key because of this location. It's steep. Uh, it's it, the, the gradient. All of that is is, is going to be a, a huge task just to keep that thing in place. But I just want to make sure that everybody understands that if this thing starts falling apart, I'm going to start making phone calls, and I just want to know who I make that phone call to. It's very important that this gets done right. I've, I've lived there for 26 years, and I've seen so some real crazy stuff with runoff and, and snow. So that's kind of all I wanted to uh, talk to about. Talk Thank to you. About. So appreciate the, uh, the chance to speak. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Any men? I'll close it. Open it up to the, to the board. Uh, I apologize. I, I, I missed the site walk, but <clears throat> yeah, I should mention that, that there was a site walk <coughs> for the public uh, by the board, uh, and some of us we did have the opportunity to get a first-hand look at the location. I'm sorry. So uh, I don't think I've heard a whole lot about the impression that you got from that site walk, and I just spent a quick second asking. Uh, is it, uh, is it steep, as steep as this profile? And then some. So. And then some. Yeah. And um, certainly the uh, public works director's comments are uh, such that uh, they almost don't wash their hands of, <laughs> of anything to do with it. But the, um, the traffic analysis uh, suggests that all of the average speed is about 50 miles an hour. Yes. That and the site distances uh, do meet the criteria. 450 miles an hour, yes, and the posted speed limit, which may be a move point on the stretch of road, but, which is 35. And uh, he did actually do a field study of the, you know, 85th percentile speed and all that. 
Um, as far as the uh, landscape issues go and all that, 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 as far as my memory goes, it's always a part of the approved plan. Yes, and that landscape plan there is preliminary. So what we would do is that would be that would be bonded. So there would be money for that. Say this, the, the client something happened, the death or something. Uh, that money would be in there in the escrow mm -hmm. to have the, those installed by somebody else. So and they would be part of the approval and a condition of approval that they be planted before, say, the first building permits issued or, or something like that. We're so I, I think, a, uh, if you don't mind. So I think a couple of good points were made, though, um, in that um, the number of trees might, it's probably not as important as a number of trees so as to satisfy a certain mm -hmm. goal and intent. And, I, and I, you I, can, and you can maybe, this is preliminary, right? So you'll be back again. And you can, maybe you can come back with some different language, maybe some different illustrations to show that. Um, what what is the reference to the uh, the fence and the private property issues? So the 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 fence is actually on the other side uh, of uh, Herb's property, and what it is 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 a fence on top of where there's a cut section. Uh, probably will be a blast uh, edge wall there. Uh, I put the fence there for safety. You don't want someone kind of wandering down by the hill and, and not knowing that they're stepping off, you know, over like an eight-foot drop. Um, and so when we when we met with Public Works, they were happy if it was a private road. They, they don't care where the fence is, so it's back on within our property. Okay. And, and as far as the private road goes, it, it, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, Dan, uh, Dan but uh, that has to be both the town standards, does it not? It needs to be both the town standards, even if the town doesn't accept it. Um, so whether it's private or public, it, it still is engineered and built to the same standard. That's the expectation. Yeah. And that's we're still waiting for more information on, again, the intersection of this new road to Mitchell Hill Road, given the steep grade of the Mitchell Hill Road. It's challenging to intersect it in a way that meets town standards. The town standards is a 3% grade at the intersection. Um, and so that's where we want to work with the applicant to really understand how's that intersection going to work to meet town standards and to safely accommodate ingress and egress. It's, it's, uh, so there's, so there's a, uh, a bit more discussion on that on that matter, particularly on that matter. Okay. Um, and uh, should should you overcome all these challenges, the road would be a part of an association, I would believe. Yes, there will be a uh, homeowners association, which will also include a road maintenance agreement, which they'll pay in escrow, and the fees will go to, you know, for a party to maintain the road, and, uh, all those things that are associated with a private road. So those are the folks that you'd call? Yes. If there was an issue yeah. with the road? Yeah. Okay. Um, and of course, uh, just as a side note, not only does it make um, a lot of sense on many levels that a private road be built to the same standard as a town road, but We've seen over the last several years private roads petition the town to accept them as public roads. And, and certainly it's a lot easier for the town to consider such an endeavor when we know that the road is engineered to the, the high standards. Yes. That public yes. Roads are. This is to be built to the town standards, by that. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, I was on the sidewalk. The, um, the road, roadway is a challenge. It was a challenge. And um, I, I, it seems to me that the um, just regarding the roadway, the biggest issue is making sure the praise is satisfied with their situation. So what you're saying basically, when we were going along that proposed road, your left side is going to be blasted and you're going to have a fence up along the top of that. Yes. But then there's going to be these rows of um, conifer trees is that all that's going to be there? Did, wasn't there some discussion about some sort of retaining wall, possibly, or something like that? No, the retaining walls would happen on the, uh, I think it's lot four, as you go in. Um, oh, in the, the, yeah, to set, sort of to create like a backyard for the house, and there'd be some terracing um, going in there. And with respect to the, to the individual lots, um, grading there is, is, is conceptual, as is the, the footprint and all that stuff. And we would propose that there's actually a, a condition of approval that every lot has to have a, a an engineered stamp lot uh, development plan 
which would sort of ensure the intention of the design and the sort of the, the safety of, of each lot as they go along. So, um, so what you have is, you know, you're coming in a hill and you've got a blast on one side and a fill on the other. And then we would plant uh, trees on the fill side, yeah. maybe up even in the slopes to sort of provide. The main screening that the trader would be is where you're turning in right at the entrance. And we try to put the, a number of plantings up at the level of the, at that intersection. Yes. So as the block, the headlines. Up. That's why they, they, they're, they're set aside more or less, they're not aligned with the others. Yes. Okay. And that's going to um, inhibit the headlights and things like that. What about runoff? There was, they had a real concern about runoff. Yeah. So this actually should, you know, if constructed as designed, help. The only runoff that they're going to continue to see is coming down the ditch line mm -hmm. in uh, Mitchell Hill Road. And the rest is going to be picked up by curtain drain all the way up to the road and then pipe down past their property and back uh, towards the back of, of the client's, the applicant's proposed property. Okay. So. And you'll be coming back with some more regarding the lots and everything. Yep. Yeah, whatever detail uh, uh, the town feels is needed, you know, we'll provide. I guess that's all I got right now. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I agree with my colleagues that um, another Iteration of this is necessary, and um, you know, hopefully, you come to address most of these issues. And it looks like you're, you're starting with that kind of at least a uh, major and major concern about this roadway. If I was reading the sheets correct, when you pull your car up the hill coming off the Fortune Estates and you're looking to turn left or right, um, that slope, that grade, it, it looked to me for the first 30 feet, it's only about a foot. Is, is that the intent? So, yeah, so you know, there's a flat, flat block. hill looking left and looking right. So you, you come up from your house if you purchase one of these, if you come up the hill, you come up at the town standard of 8%. And then what we've done is we've flattened it out for about 30 feet to where I call it the launch pad. If you look left and look right, you have a flat spot to accelerate from at the town minimum of 0.5%. And it, it just creates, it's like an extra 0.2 seconds to get off the traffic. Which and then um, my other question, I, I might have overlooked this in detail, but at the bottom, um, will there be any type of safety fence there to prevent, say, an icy road and a car coming down and going through the back of it into that guy's yard? Like down here? Yeah. Well, so that's, this is all pretty flat yeah. right here. At like that's okay, it's just the initial So yeah, the, the, okay. there'll be a, the, the, uh, like downhill skiing, you know, when you get to that flat spot where they, <laughs> they can get some traction. Okay. Um, where does this start exactly? Uh, we'll look at the contours, but lot one's driveway. So, for instance, yeah, they, the they slope trying right to make this? The, the slope right here is you got about 80 feet of uh, slope coming down to about 1%. And here's a low spot. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we can shift this driveway. Uh, as close to this turnaround as possible to still meet the town standards for having driveways within uh, just a more safe entry yeah. into the driveway is what I'm asking you to consider. Um, I'll send that and I'll set for right now. Thank you. I'm going to be very brief because I want to get the last um, applicant in before we close off tonight. Um, I have a lot of concerns about this project having seen it to be honest with you. So. I get to hear more about in the next line with the grading and the safety features that are involved in that. Um, cars going in and out. The stormwater maintenance and how it will not affect the abutter. Uh, when exactly and not only what kind of uh, landscaping but when exactly is it, is it going to be started and finished? Um, what impact is the blasting going to have on their foundation and then their structure? And guarantees that, uh, you know, because I've been involved myself personally where blasting was way off and still affected the foundation of my house. So I, I've got to be reassured along those lines. Um, Needed the answer to the question that was asked about the 
how the road is going to be completed and what's the distance from Lot 1 to their property line. Uh, I know, that objectively, uh, it's going to take a lot to convince me to give approval to this particular project, having seen what I saw and the reservations of the town engineer, uh, the Department of Public Works. Uh, so, your next presentation has to go a long way towards answering a lot of these detailed questions uh, to satisfy uh, my line of thinking to approve this project. Okay.